वसुदेव सुत कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकनंद कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु So we have done. We have finished the ninth chapter, and that's halfway through the Bhagavad Gita. And today we're going to start the tenth chapter. The tenth chapter is Vibhuti Yoga, the Yoga of Glories, Yoga of Splendor, uh, the Glories of God. Somebody looked a little puzzled. That oh, for a moment I thought it's my glories. Now the glories of God, but yes, in one sense, our own glory also, from an Advaitic sense. All right. Before we start the tenth chapter, just a few words of introduction, and then we'll go on. So, take a look at the big picture. One way of understanding the Bhagavad Gita, which I have mentioned earlier, is to see it as. Um, the mahavakya tattvamasi that thou art madhusudan saraswati does this and number of advaitic teachers do that what they do is they divide the 18 chapters into three groups of six chapters each the first six chapters are um, about our real nature who am i about that thou art about you and then the next six chapters from uh, 7 to 12 are about that god and then the last six chapters from 13 to 18 are about um, the identity of that and thou you and god very neat the gita doesn't really fit into that <laughs> neat uh, categorization because in each uh, of these uh, groups you will find lots of stuff which don't actually uh, fit into that category but as a broad classification there is some truth to it because you'll see especially in these six chapters from 7th chapter to the 12th chapter it is about god it is about devotion to god it's uh, heavily tilted towards that um so uh, in the last few chapters we have been talking about god and we were introduced that this concept of god's higher nature and lower nature para prakriti and apara prakriti god's higher nature is consciousness and lower nature is material nature this entire universe and that's a neat way of looking at it because our experience it neatly falls into these two categories i the conscious knower and this the universe which i know everything that i know is an object to me the consciousness and i am the conscious knower so consciousness and material nature in fact these are the two great categories in sankhya philosophy and yoga philosophy purusha and prakriti now where god comes in is this this consciousness pure consciousness in association with material nature with the cosmos is the god of vedanta i'll repeat that consciousness in association with the mit of the cosmos itself everything is the god of vedanta those who remember mandukya upanishad the mandukya karika uh, consciousness plus the power of maya is called god or ishvara consciousness plus the power of maya plus all minds the entire cosmic mind uh, is called um, hir, uh, hiranyagarbha the cosmic mind and consciousness plus the power of maya plus all minds the cosmic mind plus the cosmic body all bodies living bodies and the insentient universe all together that is called virat what arjuna experience will experience in the 11th uh, chapter of the bhagavad gita but this ishvara hiranyagarbha virat this is the vedantic conception of god basically consciousness and material nature awareness and the cosmos it's a lot like us the difference is this we are the same consciousness but with one fraction of the associated with one fraction of that material nature not with the cosmic body of the universe but with one body 
not with the cosmic mind, with one mind. And with a fraction of the power of Maya, in our case it is called Ajnana or the causal body. So we have a causal body, a subtle body and a physical body, but one and a tiny bit of this huge material nature. The causal body is part of material nature, um, the subtle body is part of material nature and the physical body is part of material nature. Associated with the slice of that, you become an individual sentient being. Consciousness becomes an individual sentient being like us. Associated with all of that, consciousness is God. So this is the Vedantic idea of God. Of course, the core teaching of Advaita Vedanta is beyond that. The fourth, not the uh, waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, but the Turiya, which is consciousness itself. But we are not going there now. We are, we are now sticking with the, with the idea of God, with the teaching about God. So this is God. And this is the individual sentient being. What's God? Pure consciousness, limitless consciousness, plus Maya, plus cosmic mind, plus cosmic body. What's us? Pure consciousness, the same pure consciousness, but limited through, reflected through one tiny bit of Maya, which, called Agya, which is called Ajnana, and one mind, and one body. All right, we'll leave it at that. Now, what about the world, this physical world, this material world, of which our material bodies are also a part, and this uh, insentient universe is also a part, you know, planets and stars, uh, quarks and quasars, and all of that, this material universe. That's what he's going to talk about primarily in this chapter, that all of this material universe is the glory of God, is the splendor of God. That's this, what this chapter is about. Where does this come from? God is the creator of this material universe. That is the idea of God in all theistic religions. All religions which believe in God, they think of God as one, one common idea is God is the creator. God made this universe. God made all of us in the sense of the bodies and the minds uh, and the physical universe. And in Hinduism, God is the creator, preserver, and destroyer who projects this universe, who uh, maintains it, and finally dissolves it only to project it again. Now, and in a sort of preliminary idea is God is separate and the creation is separate. But in Vedanta, we uh, don't say that. We say that the creator and also the creation uh, they are this one reality. God creates the universe, true, but out of himself, herself, itself. In technical language, these two, uh, there are two terms, uh, nimitta karana and upadana karana. Karana means cause. So, a carpenter uh, is the intelligent being who creates this table. The, so, the carpenter is the intelligent cause, nimitta karana. And the table is made out of wood, and the wood is the material cause. In this case, the carpenter and the wood are different. The material cause and intelligent cause are different. The carpenter doesn't become the table, luckily. For the carpenter and for all of us also. But there are cases in which the intelligent cause and the material cause are the same. The spider spins a web out of its own body. So spider, the sentient being, the creature, the tiny little creature, uh, is the intelligent cause because it spins the web. But its own body is the material cause. It's a material out of which the web is spun. That's why the spider is used as an example in Vedanta, in the Mundakopanishad. Yathor nanavi srijate grinhate cha Just as a spider spins a web out of its own body and absorbs it back, that's the example. Tathakshara sambhavati ha vishvam. In that same way from the akshara, the imperishable reality, that is pure consciousness or Brahman, uh, the entire universe is spun out. Now notice in this case, just as the spider is the intelligent cause and the material cause of the web, in Vedanta, God is the intelligent cause and the material cause of this universe. And one interesting thing is, 
the material cause continues in the effect. The, if the material is wood, then you will find wood here. And the effect is the table. Table is the product and the uh, material is wood. In the product, the material will continue. Don't we say touch wood? We don't say touch table, touch wood. Because this is the same material. Uh, clay pot. The clay is the material out of which the pot has been made. And when you have the pot, after it's been made, the clay is right there. Similarly, if God is the material out of which this universe is made, then what is all this? There must be God here. God must be imminent in this universe. Not only beyond this universe, but also the creator of this universe and in and through this universe. Immanent in the universe. That's why Swami Vivekananda said, we Hindus worship a transcendent, immanent God. God who is beyond time, space and causation, but also in and through time, space and causation and in this entire material universe. It's present here. Now this is the basis for this chapter. This is the basis for this chapter. The tenth chapter. Um, how is this world to be seen in Vedanta? This world, this world we are living in. What is it to us when we are spiritual seekers in Vedanta? Three things. And this I am, uh, I am quoting from a um, traditional Vedanta scholar and uh, monk from Banaras, Pranav Chaitanya Puri. So uh, he is a senior monk and he's been traditionally studying Vedanta and teaching Vedanta for a long time, you know, for decades and decades. And, uh, it's also funny how he got in touch with me. Well, he teaches uh, and then one of his students, so they are traditional brahmachari students sitting in the class and learning from this monk, but now even traditional students are online. So, at one point, one of the students said, Master, you are saying this, but Sarva Priyananda did not say this. <laughs> and he was, who's this? Sarva Priyananda. <laughs> where are you? Where? And they said, there is this, you know, on the internet and uh, on YouTube, there are these talks, and uh, he taught the same text which you are teaching, but he said it this way. So, I had this, annoyed senior traditional monk calling me from India, from the holy city of Banaras. Swami, this won't do. You said it like this and you're confusing the students here. <laughs> so there was a point in which, but then we hit it off very well. And so we, once in a while he calls and we talk for a while. So wonderful insights he gives. What is this world in Vedanta? He says three things. Heya, Divya, Brahma. Heya, to be discarded, to be given up, to be dismissed. Heya, one. Second, Divya, divine. Third, Brahman, the ultimate reality. These are the three views of the world in the Bhagavad Gita. With quotations from the different um, chapters, he proves this. First, most important, you have to start there. <coughs> Heya, why this world has to be given up? Why is it to be dismissed? Why do we have to renounce? Because of three reasons again, he says. Um, again from the Bhagavad Gita. Because Anitya, Asukha, Mithya. Because this world is, is transient. Continuously changing. And then Krishna himself says this. Anitya, Asukham, Lokam, Prapya, Imam, Bhajaswamam. Having attained to this transient, um, ever-changing world of sorrow. Worship me, worship God. So it's, it is ever-changing. Not only is it ever-changing, because it's ever-changing, it gives rise to sorrow. It's not obvious actually. I mean, why should change give rise to sorrow? Why is it that we think something unchanging is good? Yes. I mean, like a cookie. Who wants an eternal cookie? It's true that the cookie, <laughs> if you eat it, it lasts for a few seconds. But it's alright, that's good. You wouldn't want a cookie which lasted a million years. <laughs> so, why is change and tempor temp temporality and change, why is it bad? This is the great insight of the, of the Buddha. You know, because he saw that uh, to be happy, we need a lot of things to go well. Yeah? 
um, I must be rich and I must my stock portfolio must show this kind of you know Wall Street <laughs> the indexes must be at this level uh, people must like me and my Facebook likes must be at that level my health must be like this all of this should go well then only I'm happy if one of these parameters goes a little off you know, one little pin prick everything else is good with the body one little pin pin prick and I'm upset now if you do that that's one side of it all of these parameters have to be optimum for me to be happy and now imagine all these parameters are continuously changing in that case you have to put in a lot of effort to and you have to be really lucky for you for all these parameters to come to a state where you are it's all very nice for you but what will happen the next moment changing so next moment suboptimal again in that case most of the time we are bound to be unhappy we are bound to be unhappy the buddha's insight change come uh, along with grasping a certain state wanting a certain state trying to achieve that and hold on to that and in a world of continuous change it's a formula for unhappiness desire in a world of continuous change formula for unhappiness grasping that was his great insight you know dukkham dukkham sarvam dukkham all is sorrow why anityam anityam sarvam anityam impermanent impermanent all is impermanent impermanent not only impermanent kshanikam kshanikam sarvam kshanikam momentary momentary all is momentary not only momentary shunyam shunyam sarvam shunyam the void void all is void and therefore because it is transient because it is momentary and because it is empty dukkham dukkham sarvam dukkham it is uh, all uh, productive of sorrow in so it's not only impermanent but also sorrow not only that advaita goes even further it doesn't exist it's an appearance it's not substantial at all we read that in the second chapter of the bhagavad gita the 16th verse na sato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sata very central to the advaita idea of the world so it doesn't exist it's an appearance like a dream like a snake seen in a rope and you try to grasp that and hold on to that you're bound to suffer because it is productive of suffer productive of suffering and because it's false because of these reasons it is to be given up so that's the first thing now this very world is divine we will see it's permeated by divinity that is this second chapter this this 10th uh, chapter is going to show having given up this world in a sense in, don't make it your goal don't look to it for satisfaction and fulfillment the world as we see it as a separate reality out there on its own tempting us scaring us that world temporary giving rise to sorrow and ultimately not real at all hence give it up here next in that world itself this world is um, produced by god and who is the uh, intelligent cause and material cause of this world as clay continues in a clay pot as wood continues in a wooden table similarly god continues in this world this world is pervaded by divinity but you have to look for it and understand it and notice it this the signs of divinity in this world this is what that swami he said pranava chaitanya he said this is this is vibhuti the glories of god the splendor of god in this world same word first one must step back with vairagya dispassion and then look for the glories of god in order to contemplate god in in the experience of this world vibhuti of course then he goes further one one more step advaita vedanta will say brahma uh, why just advaita vedanta the, the vigyana uh, interpretation which uh, maharaj is talking about that will say it is the same divinity everywhere so that is the even even um, deeper more profound truth that in everything everywhere it's that same limitless brahman but that's one step further we are not going there we are just looking for this material world showing us the glory of god this is called vibhuti one meaning of vibhuti which the same swami um, pointed out is how the one becomes the many the one becoming the many is vibhuti the glory of god 
and the process by which the one becomes the many is the meaning of yoga here. Vibhuti yoga is Krishna saying how I am this one non-dual reality but I become this many or I appear as this many. How? By my power. And that power which makes me appear as many, that is the yoga. So vibhuti yoga, the yoga of splendor, of glory. One more point and then we will go on a little further. From an Advaitic perspective, um, why look for particular glories in, you know, the sun is the glory of God and the moon is the glory of God and the Ganga is the glory of God. Well, why not the Hudson? Why not the Thames? <laughs> And from an Advaitic perspective, all of it is the same because the same Brahman is everywhere. Why even glories? Why not awful things? Why not mean things? Why not miserable things? So everything, uh, everywhere there is that same Brahman. If, it, if it's all an appearance and movies playing on a movie screen, uh, then not only the comedy, not only the epic movie is the glory of the movie screen, even the tragedy, the horror movie, the awful movie is also the glory of the movie screen. So why just some glories? Uh, because Krishna will point out, and Sri Ramakrishna has also pointed it out, that wherever you see excellence, which you appreciate, which you, inspires you, in nature, in human beings, in wonderful people and living beings and in material nature, wherever you see excellence, glory, something sublime, and that is a manifestation of the glory of God, a special manifestation. That is a good doorway to contemplate on God. Everything, there is the same Brahman everywhere. That's, that's what Advaita would insist. But here is a secret. Though it is the same Brahman everywhere, it's not so easily evident everywhere. Somewhere it's hidden. Somewhere it's more hidden in more layers of darkness than other places. Somewhere it's more revealed. Um, so, Sri Ramakrishna also said, wherever you find a special excellence, you know, uh, in you know, a great talent or special goodness or special holiness, know that to be a special manifestation of, of God, of the Divine Mother. Krishna also will say this at the end. So that's the secret of this chapter. Yes, God is everywhere, but God is not so easily available for contemplation. It's not so easy to contemplate God in an evil person, in a petty person. It's easy to contemplate, easier, much easier to contemplate God in a noble soul, in a saintly person. So, now the glories of God. Uh, Immanuel Kant, Swamiji is a Kant scholar, he famously said that. Uh, Two things fill me with wonder. One is the starry heavens above and the other is the conscience within us human beings, the human conscious within. So this cosmos and uh, what we are within, this conscious being. Especially he, he said uh, the uh, human conscience actually. The moral sense, I think he meant that. Moral the moral law within. The moral law within and the uh, starry heaven, the cosmos above. Uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, he beautifully he says that uh, uh, the Lord out of his inexhaustible glories has created the green fields, the green fields of space and time and this vibrant living garden of the cosmos. There's a beautiful story about a man who was looking for the Buddha. So he was like a, he, it is said that he tracked the Buddha, he was trying to find where the Buddha is, go and meet him, asking people. He tracked the Buddha like one would track an elephant in the forest. That was the, uh, the example given. So he kept on meeting people who had met the Buddha. And those people told him stories of how their lives were transformed by the Buddha. So the more he met such people and the more he heard about it, he said, this is truly a very great elephant. <laughs> he, the science, you know, the, the science, this amazing science of all these stories of people whose lives have been tra transformed for the better just by a meeting with the Buddha. So these glories of God, um, uh, the commentary I am using, Sridhar Swami's commentary, there um, 
he actually starts each chapter with a verse which tells us what this chapter contains so this verse this is not part of the gita this is part of sridhar swami's commentary so there he says in the beginning of the 10th chapter ukta sankshepata purvam saptamado vibhutaya briefly the glories of god have been touched upon from the 7th chapter onwards see the same thing he's uh, he's following the same scheme 7 8 9 this is a part of the 6 uh, chapters on god so the glories of god have been briefly touched upon in the three chapters earlier seven he says seven etc seven eight nine dashame ta vitanyante in this tenth chapter they will be talked about in detail why why he says this is the purpose of the tenth chapter sarvatra ishvara drishtaye so that you can see god everywhere our complaint about god is where is god god is hidden show me god and here god will be shown to you krishna will tell you where to look for god or the signs of god like the great elephant you won't actually see god in any of these things in the chapter but there are signs of god because remember uh, the one intelligent material cause in sanskrit abhinna nimitta upadana karana so the material cause is in the creation so these are signs of god and this is actually the presence of god also implicitly as the material cause of this universe so krishna is going to mention that so that we can see god everywhere from our complaint i don't see god anywhere now krishna is going to say after this 10th chapter you can't complain anymore you see god everywhere swami ashokananda ji uh, he says in one of his lectures he was the minister of the vedanta society in northern california for many many decades and uh, um 30s 40s 50s 60s um so he says that where will i see god uh, foolish question where will you not see god <laughs> so after this chapter all right before we start the chapter just one little um like a little flag i want to and uh, say something now when you see all these the glories of god will talk about there is a temptation that this is such an amazing thing you know life um, the magnificence of this cosmos so by this can we not prove that god exists if these are signs of god if these are the glories of god then these are proofs that god exists and theologians in different religions have tried to use this in order to prove the existence of god there is particularly one a british theologian in the 18th century william paley so what he said uh, is that the glories of god this is the way to prove that god exists what is the proof that god exists we we'll look at the extraordinary design in this universe and he gave what is called the watchmaker analogy that you know in those days the latest technology imagine late uh, 18th century was a watch not watches like this a pocket watch And he says suppose you're going along and in you know in the field in nature you find a rock what would you say a eh, rock has been there it's very natural for a rock to be there but if you're walking along and in the field you find a watch what will you say you won't say oh watch it's usually found on fields and in gar- <laughs> in nature no it isn't somebody made it it's made by human hand and it's it's somebody's watch it's it's clearly artificial why did you do that with the watch even a person who does not know what a watch is uh, suppose in some primitive forest or some place uh, um you know uh, uh, aboriginal tribe they have never seen a watch but if they see a watch they won't say it's natural to the forest ah, these things are always there all around they say no it's something human made how do you know that why do you know it's artificial so william paley says that it's because of the extraordinary design of that clearly made to f- fulfill some purpose so it's been designed by some intelligence to fulfill some purpose if you know what a watch is it's meant to tell time but even if you don't know it you see it shows some kind of design meant to fulfill a purpose now he says look at the human body the human hand look at the extraordinary um, you know life forms clearly there is tremendous design in them and such a design much more complicated than the watch human beings cannot do that so a great intelligence must be behind this so from the signs of 
extraordinary design in nature found throughout nature especially in life but also in the cosmos you know you know the planets they were beginning to discover how the planets go around in orbits and all that so natural laws are being followed so the conclusion is that there must be some great intelligence and power behind this very clearly designed universe and such an intelligence and power can only be god so great intelligence great power so this is the proof of god from intelligent design you know what happened to that why i am saying this is not a good idea is because i mean the classic answer is richard dawkins wrote a book the blind watchmaker he says you don't need intelligence you don't need a god just the forces of nature by themselves darwinian evolution can do the job they can produce um, things which are extraordinarily adapted to survival in in nature and environment so that argument fails if you base your god on that argument along comes darwin uh, to paley's credit i think he was before darwin yeah so but along comes darwin and says that not necessary yeah. you don't need uh, an extraordinary intelligence to produce such amazing design just the blind forces of nature um, natural selection genetic mutation can result in all of this notice here neither krishna nor any of the commentators are making such a move they are not saying now krishna says that you know i am god and the proof is look look at these splendors that proves that i am god no here shridhar swami the commentator says sarvatra ishvara drishtaye for the purpose it's a method of practice in order to experience god contemplate god in your natural experiences it's a very powerful move where god seems to be hidden if you say god is pure consciousness with the power of maya well neither of them seem to be very obvious to me maya seems to be some kind of um, you know strange word and pure consciousness i don't know what really pure consciousness is but if you say the sun and the moon and the ganges and this and that well these are things that we see you can if you're relating them to god and krishna is saying that so these these now become doorways to contemplate on god all right that's the introduction hmm. now we go into the chapter itself those who want you can follow me in the chanting shri bhagavan uvacha shri bhagavan uvacha bhuya eva mahabaho bhuya eva mahabaho शृणु मे पर वच शृणु मे पर वच येहम प्रियमाणा येहम प्रियमाणा वक्षा हितकाम्यया वक्षा हितकाम्यया द ब्लेसेड लॉर्ड सेड हियर अगेन ओ माइटी आर्म वन माई सुप्रीम वर्ड विच आई विशिंग योर वेलफेयर शेल टेल यू who take delight in it so this chapter starts without a question i think arjuna might be thinking okay i won't ask a question he'll stop now <laughs> no such luck <laughs> krishna is going to repeat bhuya uh, eva again listen to me again why again you know in traditionally in philosophy repetition is seen as a fault you shouldn't say the same thing again and again but here he repeats it's full of repetition upanishads are full of repetition gita is full of repetition the reason is that this teaching is so subtle so difficult to grasp our minds are so fickle that we need to hear it again and again in different ways taught in various skillful multiple skillful ways the same truth has to be pointed out to us and spiritual ma- masters never tire of repetition not the upanishads not the gita the scriptures never tire of repetition because it's for our good and it's difficult and it's subtle it needs to be said again and again sri ramakrishna was much more blunt once hriday said to him his nephew uh, uncle why do you keep saying the same things hriday was afraid you know that all these all these rich and important people are coming to listen to you they'll get bored they'll stop coming all these big people are coming from calcutta to listen to <laughs> but if you just you just say the same old things to everybody 
And Sri Ramakrishna said, you rascal, these are my words. I shall say them a thousand times. What's it to you? What's it to you? Krishna is very much saying the same thing, but in Sanskrit, chaste Sanskrit. Yes. He says, I'm... And he adds, Priyamanaya Bhakshami Hitakamyaya You, I'm going to say this to you, who are you? You who delight in these teachings. So he's, Arjuna might feel that I'm feeling a little boxed in here. Right? I'm telling you because you love hearing this. And Arjuna, I can imagine, he's saying, I guess. <laughs> now you can't do anything. You've been told that you love hearing this. It's important. We are here because we, it's important to us and it's delightful. Um, often it, does, it doesn't seem so. You know, some of the most spectacular yawns ever seen are seen in Vedanta classes. <laughs> you don't see it. I see it all because I'm seeing from this point of view. <laughs> the surreptitious glance at the time and, and the incredible <laughs> yawn. Vedanta is yawn inducing. <laughs> it's difficult. It's dry. It's subtle. So, yes. That's why uh, Krishna is saying, you love it. Yeah. And that's why I'm telling you all over again. I'm going to start a new chapter now. One of our great swamis who established our center in Nagpur, um, Bhaskareshwarananda, Vipradash Maharaj, he, um, he would start his Bhagavad Gita class with a talk. He would first mention Prayojana. Prayojana means the need. Keep the need for this vibrating within you when you are in class. He would tell the assembled monks. Prayojana means, why am I here? I am here because I am seeking a solution to the problem of life. This is the greatest question that I will ever ask in my life. And here I am hearing one of the greatest answers that civilization has provided to us. In all of human history. That's why I am here. Keep this need vibrating, prayojana, need vibrating within you when you sit in class. It's really important for me. That's why I'm here. And then he would say, um, be also aware of who is speaking. It's Krishna who is speaking. The incarnation of God. God is speaking to Arjuna and through Arjuna to all of us. It's not your professor. It's not your uh, you know, the New York Times column writer. It's not, not a, a talk show host on television. It's God who is speaking to us. So that's why, again, you know, that, that uh, attention, uh, that urgency. Let me hear this. Sridhar Swami makes some comments here. He says, What are these words I'll repeat to you? He calls it, very interesting, he calls it Vachanamrita. This is literally uh, Kathamrita, which we study on, on Tuesdays, the nectar like words. He says, Madhvachanamrita. My nectar-like words, Krishna says. Why are they nectar-like? Paramam, paramarthanishtam. They're transcendent because they point you towards the highest reality. Paramarthanishtam, your highest goal. What is your highest goal? Enlightenment and freedom. Moksha, nirvana, salvation, mukti. That's what these words are about. And therefore they are uh, nectar-like. That's why M, when he wrote down the conversations of Sri Ramakrishna, he called that book Kathamrita. The Hindi translation, in fact, is called Vachanamrita. Vachanamrita, the Hindi translation. Exactly the words he, um, Sri Dhar Swami uses here. Also, one more thing. Often in the Gita, Krishna addresses Arjuna as Mahabaho, one of mighty arms, because he's a warrior. What, I mean, what do they call it? Six packs, abs or something. So probably he had six pack abs or something. But it has mighty arms. But here, uh, Sridhar Swami gives an explanation of that. What is mighty arms? He gives two explanations. One, he says, the power to do one's duty. You are capable of doing your duty. Which is very precise because that's what he did, Arjuna didn't want to do. The whole Gita is about that. That's one explanation. And the second one is even more inspiring. 
the power to serve, to greatly to serve. Mahantau yuddhadi swadharma anushthane. Great in, your arms are great in performing your duty like this battle in front of you. I was reminded when I read this of Vivekananda. He says, about duty, he says, there is, the way to grow is to do the duty just in front of us. This one in, uh, interpretation. And the next one he says, even more inspiring. Mahat paricharyayam kushalo. The, the hands which are expert in, dexterous in, engaged in, uh, in great service. It can mean the service of the great, when you serve the guru or the wise one. But it could also mean, Sanskrit is great that way. Uh, it could also mean great service. And now you see Vivekananda or all of the great ones who are engaged in the service of humanity. They are Mahabaho, of mighty arms, because they are engaged in great service. Yeah. And why do I say this? Hitakamyaya, hitechaya, because I'm engaged in your welfare. I desire your welfare. That's why I'm saying this. I have no other motive. This is not a crash course in Vedanta. You know, you pay a hundred dollars or thousand dollars and and I deliver eighteen lectures to you. No, no, no. I am not getting anything out of it from from you. Sri Ramakrishna says about those, those young boys who became the monks later on. He says, why do I love these boys? They don't even have a price. So many big people, rich people come from Calcutta. These boys have, don't even have a, a paisa to give me, one cent to give me, or a torn mat which they can offer me for, for to sit upon. But why do I love them so much? Because they love God, they want to attain God. And Krishna says, for your welfare, because you want to attain God, that's why I'm telling you. Number two, verse number two. Name vidu suragana, Name vidu suragana, Prabhavam na maharshaya, Prabhavam na maharshaya, Aham adir hide vanam, Aham adir hide vanam, Maharshi nam chasar vashaha, Maharshi nam chasar vashaha. Neither the gods nor the great sages know my birth, for I am the cause of the gods and the great sages in all respects. So he's explaining why he's repeating it. Because it's very difficult to know. Why is it difficult to know? There are other great masters, I can ask them, great sages. So no, they do not know. Why do they not know? Because they are after me. I am before them. The cause is always before the effect. The clay always pre precedes the pot. The wood precedes the table. And God precedes the universe. It's only when God starts creating, then the gods with small g, the devatas, they appear. And the sages much later. The sages who have given us the Upanishads and everything. We can go to the sages and ask them, the great uh, spiritual masters. No, they do not know. They know only if I reveal it to them. But they do not know. They cannot discover it by themselves. Uh, they are, it, the knowledge is given to them from me because I precede them. Here is de this, uh, he is declaring his avatarhood, that he is an incarnation of God. The Mundaka Upanishad starts with that. Brahma Devanam Prathamasam Babhuva Vishwasya Karta Bhuvanasya Gopta Sabrahma Vidyam Sarva Vidya Pratishtham Atharvaya Jeshta Putraya Praha Mundaka Upanishad, the first mantra. Of all the gods, Brahma was created first. Brahma emerged first. Prathamasam Babhuva. And Brahma created this universe. Not Brahman, Brahma. He created this universe and protects this universe. And he transmits the knowledge of Brahman, the spiritual knowledge, to the, to the rishis, the great sages, of whom the firstborn was his son Atharva. So the lineage of sages from whom we have got this teaching, they all trace their way back to Brahma. And Brahma emerges, you know the iconography, Vishnu is reclining, couch potato. <laughs> and... Uh, but what a magnificent couch, the <laughs> thousand-headed serpent, uh, Adi Shesha, huh? thousand-hooded serpent. 
and Vishnu reclines on that and from his uh, navel the lotus emerges and on the lotus is seated Brahma. So and Vishnu transmits all power and knowledge to Brahma. What is Brahma? Cosmic mind. Hiranyagarbha. What is Vishnu? Pure consciousness plus Maya. If you take away the Maya, what happens? What remains? You. Shankaracharya says in Aparokshana Bhuti, Avashishtam Bhavet Munihi. The sage, the spiritual seeker, after we eliminate everything, including Maya, who remains, and say, oh, pure consciousness remains. That's another way of pushing it away. <laughs> no, you remain. Anyway, that's not the subject here. <laughs> You're going to spoil the divine splendors by talking about Advaita. Um, so, Brahma. And then Brahma proceeds to create this universe. And Brahma transmits spiritual knowledge. But all of that comes is traced back to Vishnu. And Krishna is Vishnu's avatar. So, he says, they do not know. It has to come from me. So, spiritual knowledge is always through revelation. That's when revelation comes first. And then, you know, uh, philosophies and uh, all of that comes later. Vedas first, darshana later. Even the Bhagavad Gita is based upon the Vedas, upon the Upanishads. So, in Vivekananda said that uh, Krishna is not the proof of the Vedas. The Vedas are the proof of Krishna. And, and it's literally true because many times here, if you read the Upanishads, Katha Upanishad for example, there are verses which are literally quoted by Krishna from the Katha Upanishad. So Krishna quotes directly from the Upanishads here. Then, so because it's difficult, I am going to tell you this. A little bit about Vishnu's couch. <laughs> this is a very interesting story about this. Um... Adi Sesha, no, not only Vishnu, who has come as avatars, many incarnations. I, I'm sure at one point the couch also thought, I can also do the incarnation thing. So he came as incarnation. Uh, so he incarnated Adi Sesha, the cosmic serpent. Incarnated, do you know as? But, Lakshmani, of course. But Patanjali. Uh, Patanjali. And uh, the great sage with whom you, you, you're right, associate the Yoga Sutras, yes. So Patanjali, who is the uh, uh, incarnation of Vishnu, uh, of, of the cosmic serpent, Adi Sesha, Vishnu's couch, uh, is at the source of three great knowledge systems. What he gave to humanity was, this great sage Patanjali, he gave medicine for the mind, medicine for the speech, and medicine for the body. Kaya mana vakke. Mana for the mind, medicine for the mind, Yoga Sutras. Patanjali Yoga Sutras. And then medicine for uh, the speech. Grammar. So he explained the Panini's grammar. The Mahabhashya, the great commentary on grammar. And then uh, for the body, Ayurveda. So in India, the famous Ayurveda, uh, yeah, Patanjali stars, <laughs> Baba Ramdev. Yes. So th there's a reason why it's named Patanjali is because it is Ayurveda is traditionally traced back to Patanjali. So three great systems of knowledge, meditation, grammar, and Ayurveda. Medicine for the mind, medicine for the speech. Why medicine for the speech? Otherwise you'll make grammatical mistakes. Sanskrit grammar is really tough. If the one terror of Sanskrit is if you try to speak Sanskrit, you, always the terror is you can start a sentence but you don't know how to end it because the grammar doesn't match. <laughs> Um, I remember we had a master in uh, our training center, an Acharya, who would conduct his classes in Sanskrit, who would teach in Sanskrit. And you were supposed to uh, ask questions or reply in Sanskrit. So by the time I would formulate a question, already he's gone past that point, he's teaching something else. I'd get a question ready, and then I would have a question. And I would ask the question in my faltering Sanskrit, he would uh, coolly point out half a dozen grammatical mistakes which I had made <laughs> and then he would go on with his what he did. I never got an answer to any of the questions. <laughs> it was very difficult. Sanskrit grammar is very important for, for the functioning of Sanskrit. Um, the, so the story concerns the grammar part of it. So Patanjali was, uh, this is Panini Sutras are the source of Sanskrit grammar and Patanjali wrote a great 
commentary on that. So without the commentary, it's difficult to understand the sutras of grammar. If you think the Brahma Sutras, Yoga Sutras are difficult, you should go to the Panini Sutras. Much vaster, much more complex and extraordinary. So, the story goes, it's a long story, all of these stories are long. So, uh, the great sage Patanjali was teaching grammar and uh, he had a thousand students. So the thousand students would sit and li listen to the grammar um, lessons. He would teach the great commentary and they would take down notes maybe or maybe they memorized it or whatever. They, they, they wrote it down on palm leaves. It was difficult. And uh, the, But the condition was that the great sage would sit on a stage and a, and a curtain would be pulled. So he would sit behind the curtain and teach. But the rule was you should not open the curtain before the class is over. It would be really odd if I did that. You know, to draw a curtain and say. <laughs> now, naturally, students, if you say something like that, don't uh, peek behind the curtain when the class is going on, what are they going to do? They're going to peek behind the curtain. So one day, the inevitable happened. One student wanted to know what's going on. Why is the old man, why does he sit behind a curtain? And the classes were wonderful. Each of the thousand students, you can relate it to the thousand heads of the cosmic serpent. Each of the thousand students felt that I was being taught individually. Yeah, it's so wonderful, the classes. So this student, he creeps up to the uh, curtain while the class is going on and he lifts a corner of the curtain behind and lo and behold, what does he see? Not the stage anymore. He sees the cosmos, the universe. And covering the entire universe is this extraordinary being, radiant, a thousand-headed serpent with the flames of cosmic fire coming issuing from each of its uh, mouths. And he, of course, immediately faints upon seeing that. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, one spark of that fire slipped out from the corner of the curtain before he could drop it. And immediately the students were all turned into ashes. They burnt into ashes and it all, uh, the whole place disappeared in fire. And... Uh, Patanjali resumed his human form, he swept the curtain aside and he jumped in, out of the stage and he looked at the disaster and he cried out, Alas, alas! In Sanskrit, ha ha kar, which is the opposite of the English ha ha. The English ha ha means, <laughs> you're laughing, ha ha kar means alas, alas. He was not um, sad about the students, he was worried about grammar. Because what will happen to the grammar if all the students are dead? <laughs> and then one student was alive. He had taken a washroom break. <laughs> That's my theory. But he was alive for some reason. He came back in. And uh, Patanjali, he ran and embraced the student. Thank God for you, my boy. And so this student got the uh, grammar and he's the one who is the source of all the grammar. The story doesn't end here. Now this, that lone student graduated and he carried the, this great commentary on Sanskrit grammar from which we get all of San modern Sanskrit on his way back home to establish a grammar school. <laughs> and he goes on his way, carrying his notes. In those days, no cloud or no pen drive. It's just palm leaves, bundles of palm leaves. And that's crucial to the story because they are leaves. And he's tired and he wants to take rest and there's a big tree, he goes to sleep under the tree and keeping his bundle of notes nearby. And a goat comes along. <laughs> and it sees the leaves and starts munching on the leaves. A student wakes up in horror. He sees the goat eating up his precious notes, the great commentary on grammar, and drives the goat away. But alas, a part of it is lost, which continues to be lost till today. And that part of the lost portion of the commentary is called Ajabhakshita Bhashya, the goat eaten commentary. <laughs> so that's the story. Okay, I was just seeing the time passing. We will do the third one and then we will take some questions. Yo maam ajamana dimcha Yo maam ajamana dimcha Vetti loka maheshwaram Vetti loka maheshwaram Asam mudha samatyeshu Asam mudha samatyeshu Sarva Pape Pramuchate Sarva Pape Pramuchate 
He who knows me, the birthless and beginningless Lord of, of creatures, is undeluded among men and is freed from all sins. So here he states the purpose of the exercise. That's why do you need to see God in all these splendors in the universe? What you ex experience across the world, in the universe, in your life? So you see God. You notice that this is the splendor of God. That is the splendor of God. This is the vibhuti of God. What does it lead to? It leads to salvation, moksha, freedom. The one who's one who will do these exercises, sir, wait, who waiti, who knows, will be freed from all sins. All sins means all of karma, and asammura will be freed of delusion, the ignorance which makes us think that we are this little body mind. Will be freed of that, and he doesn't say how. Here, of course, the advaitin will um, say, "I have something to say." I said, how do, if you knew, know God is all this, it's all very splendid and God is the uh, material cause of this. So yeah, in some sense, all of this is God. Great. But how will it free you from uh, 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 you know, your bondage and ignorance? Well, because you will realize your identity with God. You will realize that which appears as this splendid universe and that which you are, are one and the same thing, that thou art, and then you will be free. Because... You realize what you what you are is always free of samsara, but that's not what is said here. What is said here is, contemplate the glories of God. You will develop faith in God. You will develop uh, bhakti, devotion for God. That's the limit. I mean, no, nothing more than that is going to be said here. All right. Questions, comments. Yeah. Give it time. <laughs> it's not in a morbid sense, they're waiting for them to be miserable. But, but it's, it's natural, even if you're happy. See, when you say suffering, when the Buddhist says suffering, it does not literally mean that you're always glum and gloomy and suffering. It's just dissatisfying. So, there's an old Sanskrit saying which says that for the sensitive, for the thinker, everything is suffering. The contact with the world is like a spider's web touching your eyeball. Spider's web is no problem, but if it touches your eyeball, you can feel, you feel it actually. Similarly, the contact with the world is like that. If you think, if you are sensitive. Kamu. Myth of Sisyphus, I think. The first sentence, the only true philosophical problem is, why should I not kill myself right away? Why should I not commit suicide? I once quoted this to a Mataji of our order. And she said something in, in, in French. And I said, no, 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 the, the, the first sentence is, the, uh, uh, but the only true philosophical problem is, why should I not commit suicide? I said, yes, that's exactly what I was saying. I was quoting the original French. So, <laughs> Braja Prana Mataji. Yeah. So... Uh, it will come to that. Even the most happy person, notice two things. One is this, this happy person, generally happy, there are many such people. It's not that really they're deriving happiness from the, from the world itself. Um, sometimes people, you can call it a genetic setting. They, they are, they're setting as at, at a little more sunnier disposition. Yeah. It could be. It's not really that they are having a really good time in the world. They may not be. They may be having a worse time than us, but they can still be pretty happy. There are people who are having a pretty good time and still very gloomy. So it's more of a, a mental character, a mental setup. But whatever it is, unfortunately, would it be that it would, that would have been enough? It isn't. It isn't. Will they come to spiritual life in this world, uh, in this life? No, may not be. May not be. But if the question has awakened in our mind, you, um, you cannot stop anymore. You must go forward. You can't go back to that state. Voltaire, um, better Socrates unhappy than a pig satisfied. Huh? He said, 
Pig is very happy. Socrates is unhappy. Which one do I want to be? Once I'm aware of something like Socrates, I can't go back to the pig state. Yes. Was God. Hmm. So the word I think in the original logos is God. So the idea of seeing order in the world yes. is part of seeing God. Yes. And from that comes, for example, science. Hmm. You can see how these religious insights are at the basis of our civilization, not just religion but also culture, even science. Um, yes. You often talk of the neti neti method for finding pure consciousness. Hmm. Can we think of this as sort of the yes yes method for finding mm. Ishvara? Yes. For finding Ishvara, yes. Because the material cause continues in the product, uh, which is just a dry way of saying, you know, that uh, God continues in this universe. That's a much nicer way of saying it, more inspiring. So, in that case, you affirm that here is God, here is God, here is God. I see God everywhere with open eyes. I met this monk um, in the uh, Himalayas. He lived for 60 or 70 years high up in the Himalayas. Um, his name was Sundarananda. He was um, a sevak, an attendant for a very great Vedanta teacher, whose name was Tapovan Swami who was the guru of Swami Chinmayananda, Swami Chinmayananda who started the Chinmay mission. So, the Sundarananda, uh, he told me a very wonderful story about his life. He was uneducated, literate. I mean, he had just, he hadn't finished school. He was not illiterate, but he hadn't finished school. But he wanted to become enlightened. So, in India it's a bit like, here people run away to uh, Hollywood to become a film star. So in India, people would run away to the Himalayas to become enlightened, something like that. Of course, they also run away to Bollywood to become a, f a film star. Um, so he ran away to the Himalayas, and he had a very long story of his adventures as a kid. He was a kid. Finally, he reaches, he asks around, who is this, who is the best enlightened Vedanta master now? So people said, that Swami. So he reaches this Swami, and this Swami um, lives at an altitude of 10,000 feet in Gangotri. Very difficult to reach in those days. He walks, 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 and reaches that place. And then he's turned down, because the Swami teaches only the highest non-dual Vedanta. He says, if you don't know Sanskrit, you can't learn. And you're not educated, you won't understand what I'm saying. And he has only a small core group of uh, disciples. So Sundaranta said, I like you and I like this and I love listening to it though I don't understand. I'll just stay here. Just let me stay here. I'll look after all of you. I'll clean the place. I'll warm the food which you beg and bring and I'll serve it to you and I'll take care of the place, take care of all of you. Just let me sit, sit near you and take care of you and let me listen to you. And that's what he did for decades and decades. And he became this saint. But he told me, his guru told him, Instruction, because you can't study the Gita, the Upanishads. I mean, you listen, but you might not really understand it in depth. So your special practice, he says, with his sweep of his arms, and I was in that spot where the Guru taught, told him this. You see the towering mountains and the glaciers running down, and the Ganga, which is just it's Bhagirati there, just beginning. It's a narrow, very fast stream. It's just melted from the snows. And the forests, the pine forests, the Deodhar forests all around. A spectacular scenery. So with his sweep of his arm, his guru told him, Pashya Devasya Kavyam Yona Jiryati Namamara This is from the Rig Veda. Look upon the poetry of God, which neither decays nor dies. And then he said, in special instruction to him, from now on, you see God. And he quoted from Kabir Das, Kule Nayan Dekhu Sahab Ko I see my Lord with open eyes. How will I see my Lord with open eyes? He says, you see the Lord in the Himalayas and the Ganga. That was his instruction. The special meditation he gave to this Swami. And from that time onwards, his whole lifetime was dedicated. In fact, towards the end of his life, he became an environmental activist for protecting Ganga from pollution. Anyway, 
So his special meditation was on the Himalayas and Gangas. In fact, if you look up in Amazon, there's a book called the Himalaya, Swami Sundarananda. He became a photographer later on. Photographer means not a professional photographer. He used to take, I mean, he knew the pathways so well, the Himalayan pathways so well. He told me all this because he wandered with his guru in those mountain regions. So he knew the pathways. So later on, after the independence of India, when European and American trekking teams, and mountaineering teams started coming to the Himalayas, he became a much sought-after guide in those days. But now it's, of course, very well mapped and there are uh, tours and all that. But in initial days. So he would go with them and he would take them up. And he told me some wonderful stories about, you know, how he, they would be busy in setting up camp and planting a flag and taking photographs. And he would chant the uh, Shiva Tandava Stotra and all that, you know. They, so, wonderful. Um, but what happened was, he saw somebody taking photographs in those days with big cameras and zoom lenses and all. And that uh, was probably a Swiss or Austrian somebody, uh, mountaineer. When he saw this monk's interest, he taught him how photography, wo photography works and he gave him his camera and his reels and his equipment. Now this Sundarananda had, is a very, very, very well named. Sundara means the beautiful, the aesthetic. He had a tremendous artistic sense. I mean, even at the old age when I met him, extraordinary. The little hut which he had was the most beautiful hut in the entire mountain. Extraordinary. I mean, just the artistic touch of that. It's a museum now. And this old man, for 50 years, he maintained it with his own hand. Um, so he started taking photographs, black and white photographs. But they were so good, then some, something led to something else. His guru had passed by that time. And when his guru passed, his guru told him that uh, you have served me uh, dedicatedly for all, your, for all these years. I bless you, you will rise very high in secular life and spiritual life. So, at least the secular part of it, he became a famous photographer. Because then something led to something else. Somebody discovered his photographs, they were published in the most important uh, um, magazine in India in those days those were India of a certain generation they recall Illustrated Weekly of India so his photographs were published there then he was called for tours across India slideshows of his photographs and all photographs are of the Ganga and the Himalayas all of them because so that's a special focus of meditation and later uh, I think an Austrian explorer came there and he saw those photographs and he took them all and he published them from and it's a very beautiful coffee table book which he showed me they, that uh, they gave him one copy, which he cannot read. And I asked him, this vision you had in Vashishta Guha, uh, how did that happen? And he was startled. He said, how did you know? Who told you? I said, it's there in the book. <laughs> and he burst out laughing. He said, oh, yes, oh, he put it all down there in the book. <laughs> anyway, all of this is to say the splendors of God the Himalaya and the Ganga, it's the poetry of God which neither decays nor dies. That's a beautiful way of looking at it. And Kabir Das, with open eyes do I, do I behold my Lord. Kule nayan dekhu sahab ko. All right, on that beautiful note, let's end today. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu